lower Choi Stoy area. There had already been multiple churches started in the area, but this one was a little bit different. This one was a church that was not only going to stand as a church, but was also going to stand as a school. Most people don't know it, but most of our churches stood as schoolhouses long before our schools existed the way they do today. From that, we have seen Harmony Grove come to what it is today. And one thing that we've got to be clear on, that's nothing about us. It's nothing about what we've done. It's nothing about what those people accomplished. Matter of fact, one of the gentlemen who's a relative of mine, who gave property for the church to be built, actually got excommunicated for public drunkenness about four years after he gave the land. It is in our minutes. Coolest thing I've ever seen. Not really. But it's not about us. It's about the fruit that God produces through his people when they are dedicated towards serving him, making him known, and making disciples that also make disciples. I woke up this morning. Many of y'all know I'm not a fan of this time of year. I'm not a fan of this time of year at all. I woke up this morning, the humidity was just like, so thick, you couldn't even breathe. And after this weekend that we had, Friday was absolutely beautiful. The breeze was blowing through. You, me and Jennifer went and had a picnic at, um, at the farmer's market. And then I got to start thinking about the farmer's markets opening tomorrow. And I got a little bit excited because whenever the farmer's market opens, I know that we're going to get cucumbers. I absolutely love cucumbers. So yesterday, while we were doing the work day here, Jennifer went to the farmer's market, helped with her grandma a little bit, helped with her mom a little bit, and went and looked for cucumbers. We got no cucumbers. I was kind of upset. And I understand that it's still early in the season, but you know, there's just something about those first fruits that come about. Those cucumbers at the first of the year, they're sweeter than ever. The squash are the same way. The cherries, I absolutely love cherries this time of year. I could eat a whole bag of them. They cost about $20 a bag now though, but you gotta be careful. But I love those first fruits. But you know who else loves fruit? Our Father. He loves the fruit that we produce because of what he has done in us. And sometimes I wonder, I wonder if God's ever let down with me the way I was let down with the farmer's market yesterday. He goes through, starts looking to see what fruits have been produced, comes over here, no cucumbers over here, no squash over here. And when he starts looking, he becomes a little bit disgusted by what he does not see. Because there was a time in the scripture that Jesus come upon a tree and Jesus was hungry. We're gonna read about it in a minute. Jesus came upon a tree, lush, green, lively, looked like it was just bursting to produce fruit. And as soon as he gets to it, he finds that there's no fruit on the tree. I'm thankful to say that if Jesus were to come look at Harmony Grove, I'm thankful to say that there are some fruit. Over the years, there have been many pastors that have come out of this church. Over the years, this has became a very mission-oriented, mission-minded church. When I took on the pastorate, we, saw, we had two missionaries. And because of what God's done today, we now help support 13 missionaries on five different continents, and we're hoping to get all of them. If any of you want to move to Antarctica, I will support you. <laughs> but at the same time, we've got to be careful because we can get big headed about where we've come from. And then when we get to that point of losing sight of where we come from, sometimes we forget that there is still more fruit for us to produce. In Matthew chapter 21, <clears throat> verses 18, this is what the scripture says. Now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, 
He became hungry. This is talking about Jesus. This is the Monday after the triumphant entry, or the Tuesday after the triumphant entry. Jesus had gone in on Monday, had stirred up a little bit of things when he cleansed the temple. On Monday night, he went to Bethany, spent the night with some friends there. On Tuesday morning, he starts his way back into Jerusalem, and on his travels, he becomes hungry. Seeing a long feed tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what I have done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things that you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we come together to celebrate 177 years of what you've done through this church, I hope you would help us, Lord, to remember that there is still a lot more work to do. While, Father, we know that all the work that you do is done through us by your hands, we know that you use us, Lord, as your instruments, as your mouthpieces, as your servants to take the gospel that you have so graciously given us to all the parts of the world. This morning, Lord, as we break into this scripture, I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart and a mind to understand what it is that your word has for us. And through what this word does in us this morning, we pray that it is for all of your glory and all of your purpose. This morning, Lord, I want to lift up a couple of our sister churches to you. First, I want to lift up First Baptist, Lord, who's going to start their VBS this week. Father, I pray for the children that would come into this place. I pray for the hearts of each one of them that you would be Tilling the ground, Lord, for the seed that would be sown. Father, I want to thank you for the partnership that we have with them. And I want to specifically lift up Miss Debbie to you, Lord, who I know works very tirelessly and, grac and, and graciously to serve the children. But Father, I also want to lift up Lebanon to you this morning. As they start this new chapter of looking for a pastor, Lord, I pray that you would be rising up, raising that man up right now. I pray for all of them, Lord, as they start this search process, that they would be unified by what you have done through your grace and through your salvation. But Father, we also pray that you would bring about a man into this place who will lead them to stay mission-focused the way Matt has for so many years. Father, we're thankful for our sister churches. And as we meet this morning, Lord, we know that they are doing the same thing right now. And Lord, just as I pray that you would bless us, I pray that you would bless them. Father, help us to stay unified. Help us to stay unified as one, as partners in the gospel, the way that you've called us to be. Thank you for this time that we have together. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You were created with a purpose. There are many days in our life where it just feels like we don't have any purpose to us whatsoever. There's those storms that come through that seem to zap us of all energy and everything that gives us any zeal. But we have to remember that God created us by his hands with a purpose. Just like God created that fig tree. When Jesus went to that fig tree, 
He had hopes of seeing something on that fig tree. He could see it from afar off. It was lush. It was green. It was lively. It looked like it would be a tree full of fruit. But when he got to it, he was a little disgruntled because he found no fruit. Why did Jesus make the fig tree? Do you an answer? To make figs. <laughs> it's not a Bradford pear. It actually produces something. It's good for something other than smelling like tuna in a septic tank. It is, it makes good. I love Fig Newtons. How many of y'all have had Fig Newtons? They are the greatest thing in the world. You can break them apart, put them back together. Man, after so many years, my boys get them. I eat half of them. Don't tell them. Um, but I absolutely love Fig Newtons. But fig, a tr fig tree has a purpose. God created it with the purpose of producing fruit. And just like that fig tree, we have a purpose. And before we can really get into this, we need to really dial down to what that purpose is. And a lot of people say, well, we need to go to the Gospels for this purpose. But actually, we need to go back to Genesis for this purpose. In Genesis 1, verse 28, this is what it says. God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky and over everything that moves on the earth. I was talking to a gentleman not too long ago about this, about our purpose. And he said something to me that kind of shocked me. He said, he said, well, you know, the man's purpose changed after the flood. And I'm just like, where do you get this? He said, well, after that, you know, we, we could eat meat. So our purpose changed. I didn't know eating meat was our purpose. He said, but not only that, we were given certain commands that we needed to follow. And, you know, how if the man sheds another blood, man's blood, his blood shall be shed by man. And all these things started to fall in play. And I could get where he was coming from. But one thing that kept going through my mind is the words that Noah was told by God in, Matthew, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. It said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. This has been our purpose from the very beginning. To be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth. This was the intent that God had for us, and this is the intent that we should be carrying out. And just like anything that bears fruit or vegetables... We were created to produce something useful. We were created to create something beneficial. We were created to produce something nourishing. And when it comes to this whole thing of what are the fruits, there's a lot of things that come to mind. One of the things that come to mind is the fruit of the Spirit. Y'all know them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, to which there is no law against. These are the fruits that are produced in us when Jesus Christ comes to reside in our lives. Now, again, you need to understand this. These fruits are not you. These fruits are what the Spirit of God produces in you. See, there are no naturally good people. If you don't believe me, go around the square on a Saturday morning right now. There is none good, no, not one. We are not naturally peaceful people. Even in ourselves, we war with ourselves on a daily basis. While these are the fruits that are produced in this, these are not the only fruits that he's talking about here. In the same way, some people will say, well, the spiritual gifts... Those are our fruits. The spiritual gifts of prophecy, discernment, faith, teaching, evangelism, knowledge, leadership, wisdom, exhortation, hospitality, tongues, interpretation, giving, mercy, serving, and shepherding. Yes, these are all fruits. All fruits that we produce because of what God is doing in us. But here's the thing we've got to understand. Just like... A fig has a purpose of nourishment. These fruits that we're given 
have a purpose as well. To see that purpose, I want you to go turn with me real quick to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we see another time where Jesus is walking around and they're talking about food. Jesus was Baptist, whether we know it or not. But in verse 30, I'm going to back it up one. I know you got a paragraph in there, but I'm going to back it up in one verse. But in verse 40, it says, they went out of the city and were coming to him. This is talking about the disciples. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say that there are four months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what Jesus says here. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already who, who, he who reaps receives wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and one reaps. I sent you to reap. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. And this little intro is three different types of fruit. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Now the fruit of the Spirit is what our character is. It's what builds our character into looking like who Christ was. Then there's our spiritual gifts. And these spiritual gifts help us to accomplish the mission that God has for our lives. But in this scripture right here, Jesus points it out clear what the real fruit he desires for us to produce. The fruit that leads to eternal life. Everything about your life is there for the gospel. Everything. Your children were given to you for the gospel. Your spouse was given to you for the gospel. Your job was given to you for the gospel. Your school was given to you for the gospel. Your college was given to you for the gospel. Everything that makes you up to be who you are was created for the gospel. And 177 years ago, a group of men and women realized that about this area right here. Blairsville has not always looked like what it looks like today. I can remember when IGA and Foodland were our only stores. I miss IGA. How many of y'all remember the tater logs? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And their fried chicken? Oh wow. And you always had Podgy in there working at the cashier station. I miss Miss, miss Pauline. But I can remember what Blairsville used to look like. But as I'm thinking back, or trying to think back 177 years, I'm trying to think about what it was like even then. Because, you know, there probably wasn't near as many people in Blairsville back in 1847 as there is today. There probably was not even as many people within a five-mile radius of where we are now in the town at that time. But see, even with a small population, those individuals saw a need for a church to be planted. And why did they want that church to be planted? 
because they wanted the people of the Upper Choi Story area to know about Jesus. What fruit are we producing? What fruit are we producing as a church? Because these are things that we should seriously be considering. And we need to be looking to this scripture about that barren fig tree and thinking, whoa, I hope that is not us. Because the reality is, this scripture is talking about the authority that Christ has over everything. And we gotta ask ourselves a few questions. Are we truly bearing fruit? You know, there's been a lot of questions lately about people walking away from the faith. And this is a tough conversation right now, especially with some of our younger generations. They're trying to figure out why it is that people would walk away from the faith the way they are. Because it's not just churchgoers. It's pastors. It's music ministers. It's Sunday school teachers. It's elders. It's deacons. It's people walking away from the church in a major way. And while a lot of people have a lot of answers about why they think it should be, why they think this is happening, let me give you a little insight to why I think it's happening. If all you do with church, for those who are visiting with us, think about where your church is right now. If all you do with church is come on Sundays and Wednesdays, do you think there would ever come a point where you'd ask, what's the point in this? I mean, seriously. The point is just for us to come here on Sundays. The point is just for us to come here on Wednesdays. And that's it. Especially in a day that we live in where you can watch it on TV. In your underwear at home. It's kind of wrong. But when we lose sight of what our mission is, what we do doesn't seem important. This is when we become frustrated. And I want to challenge you on something. Don't be frustrated at what the church is not doing if you're not doing it either. Don't be Dude, don't be losing vision or passion about what the church is not doing if you're not doing it either. Don't be losing direction about what the church is not doing if you're not doing it either. Because do you know what this building is without the people? It's a building. What makes this building the church? Us. When the church does not live up to its purpose of producing fruit, and I'm not talking about us as Harmony Grove, I'm talking about us as individuals, we get frustrated. We lose vision. We lose passion. And eventually, just like that tree, we wither up and die. So real quick, I want to go over four things with you. Four things with you that will help you in producing fruit in your own personal lives. Because here's the beauty of it. If we're all doing this in our own personal lives, can we say that the church is doing it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And he says this right after the disciples are amazed by what's taking place. Turn back there and look with me real quick at the barren fig tree. In verse 20, it says, Seeing this, the disciples were amazed. How did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus said to them, truly I to say to you, if you have faith. The first thing that is necessary for you to truly produce fruit is faith. Think about this. The Bible tells us that without faith, we cannot please God. There is a good side to that though. I want you to think about this. Faith 
pleases God. Did you hear me on that? Let me repeat it one more time. Faith pleases God. Because in some way, shape, or form, all of us have some type of daddy issues. Maybe daddy wasn't there. Maybe dad worked a lot. Maybe dad had to work multiple jobs just to provide for us. Maybe dad wasn't able to be at all of our ball games. Or maybe dad, even like some of us, dad completely walked out. And for most of us, all that we've ever wanted to do is please our dad. You know, that's all I ever wanted to do in my life was please my dad. And it was tough. It was hard. Because it's not easy to please somebody who is not there. That's why I put so much time into my boys. Because you know what? I found out one thing. I may not know how to be a dad, but I know how not to be a dad. So I'm just trying to do the opposite. But one thing that I've noticed, even in my boys, this is the same thing. More than anything, all they want to do is please me. Now, not all their behaviors communicate that. You know what I mean? Not every single one of their behaviors communicate that all they want to do is please me. Matter of fact, some of their, some of their behaviors don't even please me. They enrage me. But at the same time, I hear people all the time, I just want to please God. Well, right there's your answer. How do you please God? You have faith in him. Now, this faith that I'm talking about, is it some loosey-goosey doctrine that we call word of faith or even speaking it into existence? The faith that we're talking about is that God is in control. God is the author of our salvation. God will complete the good work that he started in us. And you know, when we look at this scripture where he's even talking about, you can say to this mountain and throw it and say to this mountain, move and it will be thrown into the sea. What a lot of people don't realize is he's actually paraphrasing a scripture from Isaiah 40 verse four. This is what it says. Let every mountain be lifted. Every mountain and hill be moved. Let the uneven ground be plain and let the rugged terrain be a broad valley. In Isaiah chapter 40, what Isaiah is trying to convey to them is how salvation is going to come to us through the greatness of our God and that he will level all those mountains. You know the biggest mountain in your life? It's you. Why don't you think about that for a minute? You are the biggest mountain in your life and I'm a big old mountain. Begging. But I am my biggest hindrance in my life. You ever thought about that? Everybody talks about, well, Satan, Satan's always at me. Satan's always at me. Satan only has as much power as you give him. You're the one who gives him that authority, that power to affect your life. But this faith that we have, this faith that we have, tells us in Romans 8 that there is nothing that once we have put our faith and trust in Christ Jesus, that there is nothing that can separate us from his love. And you know what it goes on to say? It goes on to say, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's the faith it's talking about. And you know what? For those of you who've always wanted to please your daddy, your faith pleases God. Rest in that. The next thing he says, and this is a little bit hard. This is a little bit hard for all of us. He said that if you have faith and you do not doubt. The best way I can sum up doubt is doubt is a midnight intruder in our head 
that keeps us from seeing the lot of day. Doubt are those things that come in our mind that stall us from moving forward when God wants us to go. And when I look back at all the Old Testament prophets, I think about how hard it must have been for them because they were looking at the world in a completely different way than we are. They were the pioneers of the faith and God was telling them to go out, to proclaim his word, to go out and take captivity of these lands, to go out to these battles. And I often wonder, would I've let my doubt stop me from that? Because we battle with doubt more than what we give it credit for. John Ottberg talks about a story of a lady battling MS in one of his books. And MS, for those who don't know, MS is a terrible, terrible disease that slowly but surely completely cripples you. It's horrible to watch people go through this. And all this time, she struggled day and night with doubting God. Because just like most of us, the question was, God, why did you allow this to happen? Well, one day she's at the beauty shop and her and her beautician are having this conversation about God. And the beautician looks at her and says, you know, I don't get where people come from because there is no way that there is a God. The lady was a little bit taken back and said, what do you mean there is no way that there is a God? She said, I want you to go out when you leave and I want you to look at the sickness. I want you to look at the people. I want you to look at how broken this world is. And you explain to me how there is a God. And you know what? That started to set up a little bit of doubt in her head. So as she left, she started looking around. Yes, she saw a lot of sickness. Yes, she saw a lot of brokenness. But she also seen something else. She's seen a lot of people who weren't really made up well. Their hair was stringy. They had split ends. Some of their hair was frizzy. Some of their makeup was completely undone. And all of a sudden it just hit her. So she runs back to the beautician. She opens the door and she screams to the top of their lungs. There is no such thing as beauticians. The beautician looks at her and says, what do you mean there's no such thing as a beautician? I'm a beautician. She said, there is no such thing as beauticians. She said, you were just in my shop. I fixed your hair. You know I'm a beautician. She said, yes, you did. But I walked out in this world and I seen everybody with bad perms, undone hair. And I said to myself, if there is all this chaos in the hair world, there is no way there is any such thing as a beautician. We have the same thoughts about God. Just because there is a lot of undone things in our world does not mean that it's his fault. One thing that he has given us is he's given us a will. A will in which we can choose right or wrong. And unfortunately, from the very beginning of this book, we see where man has constantly made wrong choices. But you know what else we see? We saw time after time after time where people blame God for man's wrong decisions. You see, when we doubt, when we doubt, we start putting blame on God that is not his. When we doubt, we take away from the authority, we're going to get into that here in just a minute, of what he has for us in our lives. But not only that, the power that he has to do some amazing things through us. So the first thing we need to have to produce food is faith. The second thing we need to do is stop doubting. Stop doubting just because your life hasn't been perfect that God can't still use you. But the next thing we really need to solidify around is we need to solidify around God's authority. The fruit that is produced in us is a supernatural fruit. 
Like I said from the beginning, it is not something that comes from us. It's an empowerment that allows us to do his will. When I was thinking about the disciples at this time, do you think the disciples had any inkling whatsoever about what was going to take place in just a few short days from this moment? The God that they've been following for three years is about to be arrested. The guy that they've been following for three years is about to be beaten to the point that he's almost unrecognizable. The guy that they've been following for three years is about to be nailed to a cross and eventually killed. I'll ask you a question. For those three days that Jesus is not there, do you think their concept of his authority was challenged? I know it was. I know it was. Even Thomas, I will believe him. He's talking about his authority. If I can take my finger and if I can put it in his hands, I will believe him. I will believe him if I can take my hand and stick it up in his side. I will believe him. And you know what? Thomas got the point. He got the ch chance to see the true authority of God. And I get it. It's hard for us to see how things are in control in the chaos of what we live today. But if we truly want to produce the fruit that he desires for us. We need to understand this. He is the one who draws people to himself through you, through me, through his word. It's his authority that they submit to when they call him Lord and Savior. And while the disciples did not fully understand this at this moment, 40 something days later, they get to see the authority of the Holy Spirit rush in and 3,000 people come to know Christ as Savior. That's authority. That's an authority that we can't describe, that we can't understand. But the last thing is he, that he tells them, because you gotta have faith. You can't doubt. You got to submit to his authority. But you got to keep in communion with him. And all these things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Prayer is the most underrated, underused tool in our arsenal. Over the last couple of weeks, we have got to see many things moved simply because God's people prayed. And you know what, brothers and sisters, and I know some of you talked about it in your small group on Wednesday night. I'm praying for John Mark Samuel Burton to come to know Christ as Savior. And that's a hard pill for me to swallow after he did what he did to us. But through my time in prayer, God has completely changed my heart for this individual. And you know what? While we may not get to see it, I know God is capable of it. The question is, what are we really asking for? When's the last time you prayed for somebody's salvation? When's the last time that you were truly broken over a friend, 
over a family member or even over a stranger in the streets? When's the last time that you were broken for your enemies, for the people who mistreat you, or for the people who've attacked our country? Because you know what? I don't know about for y'all, but for me, those aren't the prayers that I'm offering up a lot. And sometimes I wonder, because we all want to see a revival. And I'm talking about a genuine revival, spirit-filled revival, where people come to know him. I've got one question, though. Are we asking him for it? Are we asking him for the fruit that he wants to produce in us? Because you know what? If God allows it, I pray that in a hundred years, this church will be meeting on a day just like this. And they will be talking about how many pastors have been birthed and come to know Christ out of this church. How many people have been saved because of the work of this church? How many missionaries have been sent out because of this church? But not only that, how great God is because he decided to put it in the heart of a couple of men and women to start a church 177 years ago to take this church and reach the nations. Father, wow. When I think about the possibilities of what you could do, not only through this church, but also through our sister churches. A sense of awe comes about me. Because Father, you even told us in your word that you have chosen the foolish things to confound confound the wise. And Father, I know that I'm one of those foolish things that you chose. But Father, what I'm even in more awe of is how far your gospel has expanded in this church just in the lifetime that I've got to see it. Father, we know it's because of the fruit that you produced in us, because of the faith and not doubting, because of your authority and people asking. And I pray, God, that as a church, that you would help us not to lose sight of that. Father, as we take this time to fellowship with one another, to love on one another, I pray that you bless every bit of it. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that you would bless the work of what will be done in this church, not only today, but also in the years to come. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Tommy, if you will, come on up. The song that Tommy chose for offering, or not offering, for invitation, is so suiting. Because it's one of those songs that helps put us in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. See, the song was wrote many years ago. And it talks about an amazing grace that come for us when we were running from it. You see, brothers and sisters, grace is God's gift to us because punishment is what we deserve. So as they sing and as we sing, I pray that your heart would be ignited by the words of what this song says, but also that your heart would be ignited by the fruit that God can produce in you.
Hey guys, Pastor Scotty Gerard here, and I just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. We really hope that this has been a resource that's helped you grow in your purpose for God, but also grow in His glory. We also want to extend an invitation to you to join us here in person at Harmony Grove. We are located at 1008 Town Creek School Road in Blairsville, Georgia. We would love for you to come be a part of our service, to be a part of our small groups. If you have children, we have children's classes on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning. And all this information can be found on our website. We'd also like to continue help you in your growth with Christ. If you have a question, maybe a prayer request, or just need to talk to somebody, you can contact us in the emails below in the description, or you can also contact us through our app and through our website, which are also found in the description below. Again, we hope this has been a blessing to you because we know that you joining us today has been a great blessing to us. Thank you so much. God bless.